Greetings to the film producers, actors, writers, directors, and builders of 2067. Bonjour aux cinéastes, acteurs, auteurs, réalisateurs et bâtisseurs de 2067. As Governor General of Canada, I was pleased to be asked to add a message to this time capsule in 2017 as we mark 150 years since our country was formed. On m'a demandé d'exposer mes visions, mes espoirs, de ceux et celles qui travailleront dans l'industrie canadienne du film dans 50 ans. Pour ce faire, j'ai choisi de reculer de 400 ans. 400 years ago, Shakespeare was hard at work writing masterpieces that would last for centuries. No doubt his works live on in 2067. One of my favorite lines was delivered by Polonius, who plays the fool in Hamlet. Polonius is speaking to his son Laertes, who is leaving to attend university, when he says, this above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. To thine own self be true, a useful bit of wisdom across the ages. Sois loyal envers toi-même, quel sage parole peu importe le siècle. Les meilleurs cinéastes et réalisateurs canadiens ont su être loyal envers eux-mêmes, et je suis sûr qu'il en sera de même en 2067. From the year 2017, I wish you a happy 200th Canadian birthday and every success in your film and media efforts. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back and joining us on live stream, courtesy of the Canada Media Fund. Uh, note to everyone watching by live stream, we have a concurrent stream that is simultaneously translated into French. You can find a link to it at primetimeinottawa.ca. Before hearing from Minister Jolie, I'd like to turn to Rina Fraticelli of Woman in View, who is here to give us an update on their two times more initiative, which aims to double the number of Canadian women directing live action TV in two years. The initiative was launched exactly one year ago here at Prime Time, and Rena is here to give us an update on how the initiative is going. Rena? Thank you, Scott. Uh, friends and colleagues, it's such a pleasure to be back here at Prime Time. Twelve very short months ago, on this very stage, I had the privilege of launching two times more an ambitious strategy to double the number of women directing scripted TV within two years. Thanks to that CMPA launch pad and to the support of so many of you who are here today, I'm happy to say we've begun to see some progress and that I believe we are on track to meet that goal next year. <clears throat> the guidance of our very stellar advisory group, coupled with strong commitments from NFB and Telefilm Canada have helped to create um, an, an atmosphere, a landscape of possibility this year. And dozens of intense and engaged and engaging conversations at conferences and festivals throughout the year have kept that awareness growing and the momentum building. And without a doubt, <clears throat> the CBC's commitment to having women direct half or more of the episodes of their scripted series has made a profound difference. Two times more partnered with the award-winning Sinking Ship Entertainment to pilot a simple and effective way to bring new directing talent into TV. It's <laughs> so simple. Two times more offers financial support to offset the shadowing costs associated with employing women directors who are new to your set. So far, as a result of just this sinking ship two times more pilot, seven women have, to use J.J. Johnson's expression, knocked their episodes out of the park and are moving on to more and more work. I, I hope you'll check out some of their stories, which is in this like little booklet that's out in the lobby and online. <clears throat> Corey Coe and Marguerite Piggott asked, what more producers and broadcasters could do to move this initiative forward, and specifically to dispel the persistent myth that the talent pool of women directors simply isn't deep or diverse enough, when in fact it's rather our awareness and familiarity with this talent pool 
that's really not deep enough. And this thinking led to an initiative we're calling Five in Focus. As Louise Clark put it, Five in Focus is an invitation. We simply want to say to our colleagues, these are terrific talents. You should get to know them. So I'm pleased to announce the 2017 finalists for the Five in Focus. And they are Gloria Kim, Jem Gerard, Sharon Lee, Wendy Morgan, and Wendy Mangesha. Apart from the attention they're sure to get from all of you, um, these directors will receive $2,500 in services from William F. White, and they'll participate in a networking a day hosted by Telefilm Canada, and they will enjoy the Whistler Film Festival, the Vancouver Film Festival, and the Toronto International Film Festival. I can't wait till they're all household names. And I encourage you to get to know them before they're scooped up by our neighbors to the south. So we're off to a good start, but it's just a start. We're not there yet. We need every showrunner and every producer and every broadcaster in this room to commit to hiring more trained, talented, set-ready women directors this year than you did last year. And I look forward to being back here next year to applaud all of you for doing that and to announce that in 2018, as we come to the conclusion of our sesquicentennial celebrations, Canadian media has more than doubled its women directors, and full racial as well as gender equality is in our sights. Thank you. A bientôt. Thank you for that, Rena, and thanks to everyone involved in this wonderful initiative for helping change our industry for the better. And why? I guess we have to say because it's 217. Now, I've only been chair of the board of the CMPA since June 2016. And in that eight months, it's hard to fathom the amount of work that has been undertaken by our next guest, as she urges us all to look forward at an involving partnership between government and the creative industries at large. Not only are we celebrating the year of Canada's 150th anniversary, but we are in the midst of the most important cultural review in generations. Almost exactly one year ago on this very stage, Minister Melanie Joly vowed to, in her words, hack the system in order to ensure a bright future for Canadian content in the face of the ongoing digital shift. And in the intervening year, she has done just that, launching the Canadian Content in a Digital World consultation. In addition to soliciting the opinion of Canadians through social media and online submissions, the minister and her staff have traveled to cities across Canada, from Vancouver to Halifax to Iqaluit, seeking direct input from members of the creative industries on how to strengthen the discovery, creation, and export of our content in this rapidly evolving media landscape. And I must say, we at the CMPA took her exhortations to consult to heart, and we constructed countrywide town halls of our own to ensure that we understood the hopes, dreams, and fears of our members across the country. That input informed the submission we made to Heritage, and we think it reflects a very reasoned and well-researched approach, not rooted in the here and now, but also embracing change and the opportunities of the future. It is our honor to welcome the minister today to share what she has learned with Reynolds Maston, President and CEO of the Canadian Media Producers Association, and all of us here. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Reynolds Maston and the Honorable Melanie Joly, Minister of Canadian Heritage. Happy to be here. <laughs> With us at prime time. Yes, and I must say, I must apologize for the fact that I was a bit late. Uh, I was just with the Prime Minister in Montreal because of funerals of um, the uh, victims of what happened, uh, the terrorist attack that happened in Quebec. And therefore, I, I, I wish if we could take a moment of silence to honor the uh, victims and also their loved ones that are affected by this tragedy. 
it makes us all the more appreciative that you're here, Minister Jolie. Um, one quick programming note before we dive in. Um, there is going to be a media scrum with the minister immediately following our Q&A right next door in the green room. And I believe we're going to start with the video. So that video is a great starting point for our conversations. So let's talk about the consultations. You did a series of town hall sessions across the country, mm -hmm. uh, met with hundreds if not thousands of Canadians, including some people in this room. I recognize some of the faces on the screen. Then you got hundreds of submissions through the online consultation process, where fortunately everyone agreed on everything, so it's smooth sailing <laughs> from here. So now looking back, now that that first phase is done, uh, how do you feel it went? I'm very happy. I'm happy um, that uh, there's been an evolution in terms of uh, people being engaged in this pro process. 20,000 people, uh, 30,000, sorry, 30,000 people participated in uh, this uh, process. This is one of the uh, most, uh, how can I say, important public consultations in terms of the level of engagement um, within our government. And let's just say that we did many public consultations in 2016. Um, and uh, also what's interesting is um, we saw a broad range of, of, of people getting involved, maybe actors, um, musicians, producers, even uh, private broadcaster, uh, the public broadcaster, and also uh, some telecoms and some digital platforms. So, and at the same time, um, people in the music industry, in the virtual reality sector, uh, people in performing arts, uh, working uh, with, with uh, the, the talking around the table with uh, people that are much more in the film sector. So it was interesting also to have this conversation. I think that the time was just right. 
Um, and that's why also I saw an evolution in the discussion and, uh, and clearly uh, a need uh, for, for, for modernization. Um, we know we have, in the next weeks I'll be doing that, we need to have a better sense of what are the indigenous perspectives and also we need to connect more uh, with youth and I'll be making sure that uh, I'll do that in the next weeks to make sure ultimately that all voices are being heard. You would have heard many, many opinions, of course, but did any common themes emerge through the consultation process? Well, that's why we hired Ipsos, an independent firm, to produce a report that will be made public in the next couple of weeks. Of course, the issue is very complex. In this context, from what we heard, there, there is a lot of support for the three uh, supports that we presented, the three elements we presented, the respect of choice of the citizens while uh, supporting our content creators who are at the heart of the ecosystem. And then make sure that we have a, a diversity of voices. And furthermore, that we support local content development, credible sources and reliable sources. And thirdly, to ensure that we have an economic and social innovation approach through our public policy. More regulation. Some others said there needed to be less regulation. Of course, that's the decision we'll have to take. Um, and clearly some themes that I heard, the fact of having a, a platform agnostic approach. That was certainly something I heard strongly. Um, the fact of, of having predictability when it came to tax credits. Um, that also was, I heard that loud and clear. Um, having also an approach uh, that could entice risk taking uh, and also being able to scale up our businesses from startups to much mature businesses. Um, and what I really heard uh, you know, again, loud and clear was a need to have a um, balance between the social objectives and the economic ones. And that has always been the policy uh, in Canada. That was certainly the thinking uh, at the time when this policy was developed. And that's certainly something we'll bear that, that, that we'll bear in mind. You've spoken frequently about the need for Canada to have an export strategy when it comes to our cultural products, Canadian content. Um, I know you're working on that. Um, how close are you to maybe announcing something in that area? Mm. Well, first of all, um, in our last budget, we announced $1.9 billion in arts and culture, and that's the biggest reinvestment in 30 years, and we're the only G7 country reinvesting so much. Um, in that $1.9 billion over five years, it, there's $35 million over two years to develop an export strategy. And so um, we have been moving on this, and in the next weeks, in 2017, for sure, I'll be uh, announcing our cultural export strategy. That will be the first time that Canada has a cultural export strategy. But more than that, um, we're moving on this in the sense that um, a couple of weeks ago I was in China and uh, I had the chance to meet my counterpart. And uh, we both agreed on the importance of opening uh, our uh, markets and collaborating politically uh, to ease the uh, opening of these markets. Um, we both have um, at heart, the uh, growing our GDP in the creative industries. And so that's for the political level. That being said, in Shanghai, I had the chance to create an expert advisory committee to help me and help uh, businesses, creative industries, business, businesses to uh, enter the Chinese markets 
uh, the Chinese market. And uh, on this expert advisory uh, panel, there is the Cirque du Soleil, Cavalia, uh, people from IMAX, also uh, minority media, um, the Sheridan College, and, and key executives, uh, key Canadian executives working within Walt Disney. Um, and so um, we've done that, and that is the first step to do cultural, actually commercial cultural missions. Uh, and we would like to do that in other key markets as well. It reminds me of what Jean Chrétien did many years ago, and they were very effective, and they also really helped brand the country as well. Well, you know, there's been a tendency for a long time to bring artists in these trade missions and uh, to showcase the great uh, creativity and uh, the arts and culture of our country. And that was in the context of cultural diplomacy. And we believe in the importance of cultural diplomacy. But I also think that our sector is mature enough that uh, we can really export quality content. And therefore, I believe that we can have these trade missions, but of creative industries only. And that's exactly my, my goal. I uh, want to take you back to the Banff Film Festival, or Television Media Festival, that's, that's the one, um, where you did a Q&A with John Moranis. And there was something that you said that really uh, stuck with me, because he at one point asked you, um, Minister, when people are thinking about their submissions for your consultation, what are some of the things that they should bear in mind? Uh, and one of the things you said was um, that each of us should be consciously turning our mind to how our proposals will impact other stakeholders in the system. And that really resonated with me and I think a lot of people in the room. Um, and then since then I've reflected a lot on that and so I wanted to ask you, um, is it really possible to modernize our federal cultural policy toolkit without creating winners and losers? Well. Good question. Um, I think that um, we need to have a holistic approach, and that was clearly the, the um, my my uh, my concern when uh, answering this question. Uh, and I think maybe I added at the time that I wanted to everybody to 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 try to play the the game of being in my shoes. I'm not sure everybody wants to be in my shoes right now. Um, you can laugh. <laughs> but um, that being said, I think that we need to be clear in terms of where we want to go. And where we want to go, we know that, first of all, we need to balance uh, the social impact and the economic impact. And so in terms of the social impact, um, we have a clear social contract in this country. It's based on three pillars. The importance of both our official languages, so the reality of the English-speaking and French-speaking markets. Um, the second one is about pluralism, so uh, the uh, minor giving uh, some, some uh, of course, uh, recognizing the importance of minority voices. And the third one is the reconciliation with indigenous people. So, our policy making in every single field of policy making within government needs to take into account this social contract. The second thing is um, we are in a creative economy. This is, this, and we have strengths in the field. So we want to, I certainly want to make sure that um, we, uh, while developing this policy, we are creating good jobs that we're creating good businesses, that uh, we are creating an economy around it. And I, as I said, I really think that because we're the, you know, I've said it so many times, but I think it's worth uh, saying it again, we're the third biggest exporter of musical talent in the world, we're the third biggest video games producer in the world, we're, we're Toronto is the third biggest uh, film and television production center in North America. We're exporting quality content in French and English around the world. We're winning uh, great prizes at the Oscars, at Cannes. Um, and also, we're leading the way when it comes to virtual reality and augmented reality. This didn't happen by fluke. 
This happened because of a great collaboration between government and businesses. And so the, bearing that in mind, I want to make sure that businesses can scale up and can be ready for what is happening right now due to technological changes and, and change in consumption uh, on the parts of citizens around the world. And so basically this is a shared responsibility. It's up for government to take that into account, but it's also up for business uh, and, 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 and content creators and, and the entire ecosystem to uh, innovate and, and, and be ready for this change. And I think that um, we're the, pretty much the only country in the world having such a broad, con actually the only country in the world having such a broad conversation. But I think that we are having it at the right moment and that will give us uh, in French and in English and in indigenous uh, languages also, the possibility to uh, have our content out to market. I want to turn to what is my new favorite topic, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, regulation of OTT services. <laughs> And we'll just throw in as well contributions by ISP uh, providers. Um, and there was a, a bunch of, of uh, media reporting around focus groups that uh, the Minister of Finance um, organized. Um, and one of the topics that these focus groups talked about was um, how do you feel about these topics? And the broad response seemed to be, um, Go ahead, you know, get these companies to contribute to the system, uh, but we don't want it to appear on our subscriber bills. So when you saw that focus group research come in, what was your reaction to it? Well, I thought it was a it's a legitimate um, reaction. Um, and we're studying all scenarios. That being said, and I said that also many times, Canadians are anxious towards their cost of living. And they are anxious about the cost of their telecommunication services and their broadcasting services. And so we have to bear that in mind, and uh, that's certainly something I bear in mind. Um, you've spoken frequently about the success of Canadian producers on YouTube. And I remember you talking about that on Tout le monde en parle, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no question that for library content in particular, um, it's, a, it's a great platform for exposing new audiences to that content. Um, where it's maybe less effective as a platform is when you're producing higher budget original content because they don't provide license fees. So, you know, one of the concerns that a lot of people on the production side have had is, um, you know, as broadcasters come under greater revenue pressure, um, as potentially the CMF funding envelope begins to decline, how do you fill the funding gap? Mm -hmm. And can that really be achieved by exports, increasing exports alone? Mm -hmm. um, see, so you have to understand how um, we um, took it as a government and the um, reaction um, we had. First of all, of course, we launched, we announced $1.9 billion in the budget. Then I launched a public consultations to have this conversation. Meanwhile, in December, I went to UNESCO to reaffirm the leadership of Canada on cultural diversity. This has never been done in 10 years. And right now, we reaffirm not only the, the importance of cultural diversity, in, but we did so uh, in the context of the digital age. And what I said many times is, as a government, we want to make sure that we're able to continue to support and promote our national content. And this must be the case in the digital world. And so we will be playing a leadership role on this. And then after that, what I did, went to China, went to Davos at the World Economic Forum and again talked about the importance of making sure that we have cultural diversity on, on, on digital platforms. And also I talked about, which is something that is less of interest maybe for you, but as citizens may 
uh, be of interest to you, of uh, making sure that we have a healthy democracy. And um, the other third topic I had a uh, conversation about was fairness to content creators. And we started talking to digital platforms. And we started talking to, to Google and Facebook. And we'll be continuing to, talking, uh, to talk with these digital platforms and all other platforms. And I'll be having also, I've been having discussions with my counterpart in France, within the EU, uh, with Switzerland. I'll be going to the G7, uh, talking with my colleagues from the Minister of Culture. There's never been a G7 on min of Minister of Cultures. That will be the case in March. And uh, this is a conversation that we want to bring at an international stage. And it's exactly why I'm getting so much involved in these international forums. But Canada will be a playing a leadership role on this because it is extremely important. It's the future of our news and entertainment sector. Several stakeholders through the consultations uh, proposed the amalgamation of uh, the agencies under your umbrella. So, for example, uh, bringing together CAVCO, the CMF, Telefilm. Um, and we actually, we, we did our own town hall sessions across the country inspired by your example, and this came up a lot. Um, and, and it was interesting because there was a dichotomy of viewpoints. Um, it was one of those things where, in theory, you, you say to yourself, well, um, if that could lead to more coherent sort of policy um, and execution, because it's in uh, a single agency with a global platform, platform agnostic view, um, and can lead to more efficient service delivery, then that could be a very powerful thing. But there was a lot of concern that, um, first, the process of getting there could get a little messy, um, and that, and we've seen that. We've seen that at all levels of government where amalgamation, centralization um, has not always maybe resulted in uh, enhanced efficiencies. So our question, I guess, is uh, coming out of our consultations, do you think you can achieve a super agency where um, you actually um, get the benefits, but minim minimize the potential costs. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Reynolds, you asked me about the cultural export strategy when it would be launched, and I told you in 2017, the cultural policy will be launched in 2017 as well. What we heard loud and clear also was there, there, we can do better when it comes to uh, uh, just the, the overall paperwork that is uh, and, and, and administration that is uh, sometimes very uh, um, difficult uh, to deal with on the part of uh, all of, of you and, and, and your staff. Uh, and we know we can do a better job at this. Um, and certainly I want to make sure that there is, uh, you know, less red tape in any uh, future policy we'll be uh, uh, coming up with. Really, the producers in the room should be giving a very warm round of applause on that one. We, we hear about that all the time uh, at the CMPA. That's, that's a real concern, that the sheer volume of paperwork that producers have to do um, and some of the delays that that causes as well. So, but you know, Reynolds, what, I think what I have in mind is um, people have a tendency sometimes to think that... Um, we can't modernize our institutions, and it's too complicated to do so. I rather take the risk of modernizing the institutions for the better good than keeping the status quo. That's how I approach things. Vous avez parlé de faire tomber. You have spoken about how you're trying to break down ministerial silos, in, including having a, a, between heritage and international trade and innovation. Do you have plans to undertake specific initiatives with these uh, departments? Yeah, that's a good question. Obviously, I work with innovation and international trade equally. 
Uh, first, my uh, colleague uh, D-Bank and myself worked on an innovation strategy and me for the creative industries. So this is why we are looking at all the tools that can be developed to improve our businesses in that sector. And at the same time, for the cultural export strategy, I worked a lot with uh, Krista Freeland, who was at International Trade before and who's now at International uh, uh, Trade. So it is a work that we work on together, all three of us. My colleague Navdi Baines, uh, which is the Minister of Innovation, on making sure that the creative industries are at the core of the innovation agenda. And so developing all the tools that are within the policy toolkit at innovation uh, to be open to the creative industries, that's certainly uh, things that we're looking uh, at doing together. And also with uh, my, my colleague that used to be at International Trade, which is now at, um, at Foreign Affairs, Christian Freeland, uh, I worked with her on the cultural export strategy, and now I'll be uh, working with my colleague François-Philippe Champagne. Um, but let's just say that, uh, you know, it, Ultimately, what I'm trying to do is it should be seamless for people in your industry, in your, you know, um, in your position to deal with government when it comes to creative industries. It should be easy, and therefore it shouldn't be siloed like we're organized. So that's why I'm working hard with them. Uh, I think it was last week. Uh, I think it was last week that you uh, posted. Um, four openings for commissioners at the CRTC, uh, the chair position, vice chair, and two regional commissioners. Mm -hmm. um, deadline is February 20th for anyone mm -hmm. who's interested in applying. Um, so what are you looking for in terms of uh, the qualities uh, and experiences and expertise of potential candidates for those positions? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, of course, we have an open and transparent process, so anybody in this room that wants to apply, please do. There's four positions that are open, um, and, and so um, it's, it's, we're looking for the best expertise. Uh, of course, we want people that understand the mandate of the CRTC uh, and the objectives of the CRTC, uh, while understanding uh, the uh, broadcasting system, radio, television, and the entire digital shift happening. Um, and so uh, somebody, uh, candidates actually, that uh, have the experience and uh, also the knowledge, uh, because certainly uh, this transition and this evolution of our entire ecosystem will continue, and the CERTC will be uh, an important body um, you know, uh, that is, will be at the core of this ecosystem. So it's been 15, 16 months since you were appointed uh, mm -hmm. Minister of Canadian Heritage. And when you were on the stage last year, um, you said that you have the coolest ministry in the federal government. <laughs> and I'm wondering, 16 months later, do you stand by that statement? <laughs> of course I do. Yes. <laughs> of course I do. Um, I think that, um, I think that we are uh, facing some important challenges, but many opportunities. Um, I think also that uh, Canada is playing a leadership role right now in the world, and we want to play a leadership role um, on, on this issue. Uh, I'm, I'm happy I was appointed at a World Economic Forum a president of the Committee on the Future of News and, and Entertainment uh, with people from uh, different sectors, uh, including the New York Times um, uh, editor-in-chief that is on this committee. But so it's not as if what we are going through, not everybody around the world is going through. Um, and so but at the same time, I'm, um, I'm proud of what we've been doing in the past year. I'm proud of how you've been collaborating and responding. I feel, you know, empowered by that response. 
Um, and at the same time, I, I know that there is a concern about uh, what, w how things will evolve, how th things will, how our policy will impact um, your reality, uh, and 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 at the same time the entire environment. But you have to understand that um, my job is to pro promote Canadian content. My job is to make sure that you have access to uh, markets here at home and across. Uh, across the world. My job is to be the, 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 the chief marketing officer uh, for Canadian content and to develop these networks um, ultimately for, for the content creators and, and the industry here. So I'm, I, I know that we're facing important challenges, but uh, the team and I are working extremely hard to make sure that we're, you know, at, um, we're, we're ahead of the curve because we need to be ahead of the curve because I think also changes will are happening very quickly and and I, we need to make sure that we're resilient enough when facing these challenges now because it's 2017 mm -hmm. I can't not ask you about the 150th birthday celebrations and Great as we question. get yes and we're getting doesn't feel like it today but July 1st really is right around the corner <laughs> And this is, this is a really big deal mm -hmm. in every sense. Mm -hmm. And on top of everything else that you have on your plate, uh, you're responsible as well for the Canada 150 celebrations. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, you're responsible for hosting the best party in the 150 <laughs> years that Canada has been in existence. So no pressure there. Um, and best of all, it goes on for 12 straight months. So. I'm just wondering, um, any particular events or initiatives that you're really um, particularly engaged by would like to talk about? Yeah, well, of course, there's four themes in Canada for Canada 150. Uh, there's the importance of youth, environment, diversity, and reconciliation with Indigenous people. We launch everything on December 31st. Um, on the public broadcaster was was uh, airing uh, live in five cities. It was launched in 19 cities, um, so from Moncton to St. John's, Newfoundland to Iqaluit, Whitehorse, Winnipeg, Montreal, Quebec, uh, Vancouver, Victoria, Saskatoon. Anyways, I could go on. <laughs> um, and uh, two million people watched it live on CBC Radio Canada. Um, so uh, that was, you know, this never happens usually on December 31st, so this was a success. I'm really, really happy of how uh, people uh, reacted and engaged across the country. Um, of course, there's, there are many, many uh, projects in the context of one, uh, Canada 150. Uh, Real Canada is one which is very interesting because it will be showcasing great Canadian films uh, in different cities uh, from from Sherbrooke uh, to uh, Toronto and, and 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 also smaller communities, so that's great. And also TIFF is doing something for Canada 150, and also collaborating uh, with institutions across the country to showcase great Canadian content in French and in English. So that's why, and I'm I, I'm happy to say that. The, these are you know, funded projects, but I really hope all of you will seize this opportunity to celebrate and reflect <laughs> on, on, uh, on the last 150 years, but really talk about the future and think of how we can innovate and what will be the next 50 years. And how can we have a strong cultural diversity? How can, how can we be a, 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 you know, a optimistic country and a future-looking country. Uh, and so if you can do anything, if you want to do anything from uh, getting involved in your neighborhood uh, and doing a block party uh, uh, up to uh, having something uh, within your, you know, your industry with your colleagues and all, this is the right time of, uh, of you know, for, for this is our year. This is Canada's year. Well, one of my take-homes from this conversation, yes. One of my take homes is that uh, so long as OTT services and ISP services don't pass down 
to the subscriber level, what they should be contributing to the system, then it's all systems go. Um, I'm not asking you to comment on that. In fact, the only other thing I want to say is um, we really couldn't ask for a more effective chief marketing officer for our industry, Minister Jolie. Merci. And, and merci infiniment. Thank you so much for being here again. Merci, Hope to welcome you back next year. For sure. Thanks. Merci.